to be talking today to the AI for Health. Um, if I were to actually give his full bio, it would take most of the hour. Um, so instead, I'll abbreviate. He's a university professor. He holds a name chair in engineering, professor of electrical and computer engineering, computer science, linguistics, psychology, neuroscience, pediatrics, and several other departments. Fellow of the IEEE, ACM, and several others, Guggenheim Fellow. Um, but most importantly to me, he's uh, now part of the US, USC's upper administration. USC really talks bold. It has these great initiatives, Frontiers of Computing, Silicon Beach, even AI for Health. But ultimately, it comes down to people in the president's office who have vision and implement these. And I'm really pleased that uh, Sheree is the new uh, vice president for presidential initiatives. So he's here today to talk to us about multimodal machine intelligence and health. Sri, looking forward to it. Thank you, thank you, Mike. It's uh, great to talk to the home crowd. <laughs> I just had to come up on floor uh, <laughs> to the seminar room where we've had many, many, usually DARPA PI meetings and IARPA meetings and so on. Now and then it's good to have a regular research seminar. So thank you for having me. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is to give a, just a high level overview of some of the work we've been doing in this area in my lab over the last several years, almost two decades uh, worth of work before, you know, it was fanciful to, you know, do AI and machine learning and signal processing with health application. So my lab is called SAIL, stands for Signal Analysis and Interpretation Laboratory. Um, we are, you know, uh, interested in, and our mission has always been understanding the human condition, you know, aspects of cognition, aspect, emotion, behavior, and so on, and to create technologies that can be of use, you know, to support human capabilities and experiences. And as you can imagine, health and well-being, you know, is very core to this sort of, you know, uh, mission for us. The other point I would like to make is because it's very human-centered um, and the rich diversity and heterogeneity, you know, within and across people's condition and status, you know, including due to health status variation, uh, the creation of inclusive technologies is a central part uh, rather than an afterthought. And so uh, and we also try to see how Technologies for inclusion can also be developed. So this has always been a big part of our laboratory's work. So, so in the last, you know, even like just even last three, five years, with lots of uh, exciting, you know, uh, uh, in fact, exuberant uh, advances that are happening, you know, notably because of uh, some convergence that's going on. One at the technological front, you know, we think about our ability to sort of observe and measure things in the world, uh, people and their uh, worlds, uh, and um, the ability to sort of, you know, process that information, do computation, both on device at the edge or uh, somewhere else, you know, uh, with uh, mega compute power, uh, the ability to communicate data in a variety of ways, you know, uh, the ability to actually both uh, uh, share and actuate uh, with devices on people, with people. And doing this together, this convergence has enabled, you know, us to imagine applications and possibilities, you know, we hadn't thought about, right? It's this convergence that's made this place where we are, that sense of uh, cross-disciplinary uh, partnerships between people, people from across domains, not just the usual things that we know, you know, within sort of engineering or sciences, but also with, you know, people in humanities, people in social sciences, of course, medicine and uh, healthcare systems. Um, working together, not just as in a pipeline way, but together trying to sort of define questions, you know, seek things, you know, it's very different from, you know, oh, I have a tool, please use it uh, type of an idea. Of course, the other thing is the globalization of R&D uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, again, made possible by uh, the advances that are happening in, in the broad area of computing and AI, right? Now, resource sharing, for example, is, is a core feature, not an afterthought again, right? Like, you know, in those days, people never shared like data or tools or software. Uh, and so as a result, there's also that convergence that's going on, people could think about so as a result, right, like, you know, for people like me who are very interested in people, uh, 
this this has enabled novel sort of possibilities to understand, support, and enhance the human experience in many ways. So when I think about you know uh, machine intelligence, I like that term better than AI. I always say it's looking at the full stack of the computing technologies that support us to you know sense and observe, analyze infer, you know, understand, synthesize, and interact. This whole cycle, right, particularly with people in the middle, sort of enables us to think about new, new ways of, you know, understanding, you know, and supporting human experiences, right? Yeah. So for me, uh, human-centered machine intelligence, you know, uh, looks at like, you know, methods and technologies to understand, you know, human trait, state, behavior, interaction, uh, illuminating, you know, basic, you know, discoveries that relate to brain body behavior mechanisms, and of course, building technologies that can be of uh, use, whether it's screening, diagnostics, you know, interventions or response to intervention, that sort of thing. So essentially this involves, you know, uh, dealing with data and information about people, from people and for people, right? Including how humans process and use data, right? The human perception and judgment and decision making. Now these are all important things because uh, the best clinical judgment, many of you know, is not just you know trying to uh, do a formula on you know, some statistics or uh, machine learning uh, outcome, but actually the cl clinician brings their vast experience and insights, supported by recommendations from data and other things, to make their sort of you know move decision and you know uh, based on their understanding their patients, right? So it's and so this human element is uh, built in very much within this ecosystem. Right? So. So there are two kind of intertwined goals in this problem space, right? Constantly, uh, I'm, I kind of mentioned these rich heterogeneity and diversity, you know, within people and across people and, and their and their context, right? So one of the goals for these technological sort of, you know, things that we try to do in computing is to analyze, understand, and characterize variability. And there are many, many sources of this variability. Um, some of this could be based on who you are, you know, where you are, uh, your uh, health status uh, uh, could uh, influence, you know, uh, some, what we observe and see and you know, how things unfold, whether it is in your uh, sort of uh, behavior or in your physiology or in your other kind of functions that we may be able to measure. And then, you know, what we try to do is to address the influence of these multiple interacting sources of variability. Sometimes we want to marginalize the effect of things that you know interfere with the, the particular source of variability you are. For example, right uh, when you are studying a child with a set of uh, on the autism spectrum, right. So we want to disassociate things that are related to neurocognitive differences uh, from things that are related to development, age-related development, physical you know aspects, biological like sex-related differences that are common. And then we want to sort of see how that can be, uh, you know, used in uh, ways that can support social learning, for example, right? And so these kinds of, you know, constantly being able to understand, illuminate these sources of variability and, you know, focus on some aspects while sort of, you know, addressing uh, the others is a constant question that, you know, com and, you know in computing we address, right? And so this, Kind of uh, it opens up a lot of challenges, right? Like you know, to create technologies that work for everyone in all contexts, and and you know, and as I mentioned, so these inclusive technologies are essential for creating this equitable experience. It's not just you know making sure you know it works for everyone, but also we try to do bridge the gap, right? So if there's a cognitive neurocognitive difference, right? Like then we want to see how can we create technologies that can enhance or augment. No, that's another thing we, we work on in computer science. So this is a <laughs> perennial endeavor, right, for all of us. So to dig a little deeper, right, when you look at, um, so my own sort of interests have been at the sort of more uh, biobehavioral level of, you know, uh, working uh, on computational questions. So if you look at across lifespan, many conditions from early development to later in life, right? Uh, we see that there is a tremendous sort of uh, need um, um, across the world 
in terms of how people need to be supported and understood, right? In particular, right, uh, we need to sort of you know, think about how we can characterize this, you know, whether it is detection tracking changes uh, uh, in health condition, how can we provide just in time um, support, especially, you know, um, uh, under the needs and constraints of uh, space and time. By that I mean, for example, say consider an anxiety disorder, right? You know, when someone is having a, a, a particular need, it's not going to be at the time when you are with a clinician or maybe in a place where there's access, right? Or someone has a suicidal thought, right? Uh, so how are we going to think about many of these conditions that are chronic, you know, uh, are uh, comorbid, right? For example, if someone has a, a neurological condition like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's, a lot of it is uh, you know, also sort of comorbid with sort of aspects of um, uh, depression, other kinds of uh, mental health needs, uh, not only for the uh, person, uh, the, the patient, but also people connected to them. So these are all very complex uh, systems. And so one of the things we can ask, right, how can we bring uh, ideas uh, from this ecosystem we talked about, this uh, machine intelligence ecosystem, to support uh, uh, these, these kinds of things. So for example, like the examples I'm gonna use, right? Uh, to just illustrate some of these possibilities, you know, I want to underscore one of the things because many of these conditions across the lifespan are, even though the etiologies may be different, right? They have some sort of a neurocognitive motoric element that are impacted. So, speech and human speech and language, right, are a product of exercising all these abilities in, in humans, right? The neurocognitive social elements are uh, involved in creating speech and language, you know, whichever mode it is, you know, vocal or written. So, the, so people have always used speech and language as biomarkers to characterize, track, and so on. So it's, I, I'll use that as an example later on. And so um, as a result, right, there's lots of possibilities in how um, sort of AI for health, you know, we can sort of, you know, begin to contribute in really big ways. Um, it could include sort of engineering approaches to sort of illuminate the human trait, state, and behavior, for example, in the domain of autism, right? A lot of, even though the uh, um, etiology is neurogenetic, uh, the characterization manifestation is behavioral. So people use either, you know, um, parental reports or uh, clinical observations to characterize and treat and, 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 and create therapies that can you know, support. But can, we can imagine new ways of bringing all the things that we do with language models, with you know, uh, computer vision to this domain, right? For example, uh, we can create, think about new ways of you know, bringing digital health you know, and access, uh, especially when uh, you know, that is, care to the people than people coming to care, right? Breaking that barrier. We can do that with these technologies, with sensing, whether it's uh, wearable sensing and uh, uh, you know, understanding and analyzing the context in which things may happen, a, a trigger, for example, providing support interventions, uh, creating these networks between of support between people who are need the care and people who are providing the care, whether it's a clinician or you know, family, who it is. And the need, all this sort of uh, really, you know, begs for uh, advances in trustworthy technologies, right? Which is another big topic uh, all of us, many of us uh, are working on. Uh, to not only make it uh, trusted, but also make it scalable and cost-effective, right? That's also as, as engineers we care about, right? How can we uh, make these care reach the broadest number of people across the world, right? Because still, uh, access to mental health, for example, is uh, not that you know, uh, easy, especially in many parts of the world. It's not, and so how do we talk about it? So I'm going to use a couple of domains uh, uh, of work that we're doing to illustrate some of these possibilities. The first highlight is uh, one of the areas I know, I study speech, uh, head and neck health uh, related to that area. Uh, I'll, I'll give you examples. And to show the spectrum of you know, sensing, imaging, processing, and modeling, how these play. The second is more in the behavioral health area. And you know, hopefully it'll give you some insights of the possibilities. 
So I want to remind people when we think about this, it's not just focusing on sort of running machine learning algorithms on some data that someone provides, but actually thinking about the fact that the, the spaces between this various parts of what data to get, how do we analyze them, you know, what are the characteristics, constraints, how do you interpret, infer, draw inferences, how do you synthesize you know, decisions based on. Uh, looking at it from a system perspective offers us lots more possibilities uh, in formulating questions than just you know, working on you know, bits and bits uh, parts of it. And so here, uh, the first uh, example is sort of the head and neck area that I'm going to talk about. So, um, as you know, as I mentioned, the production of, you know, use of uh, our ability to sort of um, produce, for example, language, right, is very uh, complex and intricate, right? It requires many things like from cognitive conception to sort of biomechanics and motoric aspects of, you know, movement. Uh, and the social aspects that you know we are you know uh, when we are interacting, communicating using speech and language, it, it's in context that happens, and so any disruption to any of these systems, right, would reveal itself in variation in the signals that we share, right, and of course we can uh, use that in diagnostic and therapeutic ways. So, so the, the use of technologies in these areas is not a new thing. You know, it's it's been there for a long time to acquire the right data, to analyze and model the data, apply and use this data. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing is like, you know, we're very interested in the use of this vocal instrument uh, to produce uh, a speech. Uh, so what you see in this little inset is an MR, uh, a magnetic resonance image uh, of the uh, slice through sort of the saddle slice, as we call it, through the middle of your head. So to orient yourself, you know, you're seeing the tongue, the nose, the lips, and uh, the airway. Um, and so we were very interested. It's a moving thing, right? It's very complex. I'll show you in a moment a picture. We wanted to capture this. Uh, so MRI is very slow, it, you know, but. Uh, by physics, you know, it basically tries to uh, look at how the uh, protons, the hydrogen uh, uh, protons in, in the water, uh, uh, sort of in, in tissues, uh, can be excited by a magnetic field due to differential content. You have differential signal, which can be converted to image. That's a basic idea. And because, you know, um, how you excite and uh, uh, relax it, is bounded by physics, it's a very slow technology. You know, you have to lie down. And so we've been working on applying all these advances in optimization, signal processing, and what we can call now broader AI to make this faster to observe things that move, right? So early on, you know, so around 20 years ago, we, we were able to get about 25 frames per second that kind of made us really look at things when we, you know, like speech production. So. When, when the sunlight strikes, strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white. So that made us very excited about, you know, being able to actually visualize speech uh, production and opened up a lot of questions about basic science and how people convert, you know, I, cognitive representations to motoric things to encode speech and what happens if something, you know, um, goes wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So this is... Um, and then we continue working on it to make it faster. Today, we can get over 100 frames per second. It's just like a feed. And the technology itself was made possible by advances in computing, right? It didn't happen um, just, uh, you know, because we took some something and made it happen. So here was a problem that we were able to, you know, for imaging. And how can we progressively make the, the first part, right? Sense, like the sensing and imaging, what can we observe part? That itself was advanced by sort of advances in you know parallel imaging, faster you know, constraint reconstruction, you know, all kinds of things over the years that we were able to do, right? That you were focused, but when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form. It's a child. Uh, go on. Uh, there's a question. Uh, Abigail, go on. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. So the um, the like more generally, you were focused on developing methods for detecting motion during an NMR or MRI, MRI. Yeah, so the goal was to sort of map uh, the moving uh, vocal instrument, right? The, the coordination, the timing and coordination of this 
uh, physical structural aspect. When people did structural imaging, um, they typically try to characterize sort of you know, tissue structures like you know brain and you know uh, for disease. Uh, the two major things where movement happens is heart uh, uh, functioning and then vocal movements. Interesting thing about vocal movements is because it is uh, it's volitional a lot of the times. Like we use it for swallowing, for example and our speech. And speech is like an important uh, function uh, humans involve. And as I mentioned, it, it, it kind of you know, uh, uh, requires a lot of subsystems to be working, right? You know, so we were very interested in the dynamics of speech production. Uh, we, no one could map it, right? We only had the access to audio signal as so and see. But actually seeing and quantifying this, I opened up, you know, all kinds of possibilities. We can actually start modeling and using this to create things. That was the motivation. Yeah. So in fact, in the, during the pandemic time, we, uh, a bunch of colleagues us, uh, were able to get a, a major instrumentation grant and we've created a, our own scanner uh, in UPC. Uh, it's a uh, unique thing about this is it's a low field scanner. It's uh, when people are all going high to three Tesla and seven Tesla to get, like, we wanted to go low because for a lot of reasons, you know, uh, because there's quieter audio environment, for example, but more uh, from a signal point of view, imaging point of view, um, the, the off resonance constraints, right? Between say, for example, when things are moving, uh, you know, it, it causes artifacts, uh, tissue heating, so we can do more interventions uh, directly. And so um, this allows us to do end-to-end -end optimization. End-to-end -end is a big thing in AI, right? Like, you know, we, from what to image, how to image, you know, a, in an interactive fashion to actually process and make decisions. So we have our own platform to do things multimodally. You know, we can do not only sort of structural imaging, now we can actually observe the brain in action, the planning, uh, with uh, uh, the vocal movement, right? Uh, and we can do physiology, all kinds of things. Uh, so it's exciting. So for people who are interested, this is a facility for all of us at USC, not just a bunch of us that started. So as a result, we were able to now, yes, Mike had a question. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, work has been done on sports, et cetera. I'm wondering with something like this, if it can be helpful as a singing coach or others, you know, uh, can, can you tell the difference between me singing and Harry Connick Jr. Yes. or something? <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. In fact, one of our early things we did like you know, was to uh, study um, um, opera singers. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, so we were looking at questions like, you know, how do people really create, um, so these various uh, expressions, uh, like, you know, um, um, head voice and all those things, ideas that were uh, pedagogically uh, you know, taught impressionistly. Yeah. And we also looked at like questions like, you know, uh, the soprano challenge, right? In librettos, you know, uh, they never have high vowels like E, right? Everything is R or low vowel because uh, we showed, you know, the physics of how when you're singing at higher and higher registers, you know, the ability to actually distinguish between vowels uh, goes away. So the main goal is to just hit the note and not necessarily. So we could actually uh, uh, demystify those things. So there are a bunch of papers I can point you to. Mm -hmm. More recently, you know, we studied uh, beatboxing. <laughs> a separate I'll, I'll, I, can, I can show you all the uh, stuff, but it's true. So we can look at the vocal instrument and also when it's impacted by, you know, uh, sort of uh, disorders or things like that. You no know, and for you know computer science people who are you know working on speech recognition and all that stuff, right? It became now we can collect data beyond the audio data, uh, which is this uh, multimodal. Now we have not only uh, what is produced, how it is produced is also there, so people can apply all the fancy machine learning algorithms and and so on. So we've created a lot of databases and shared uh, you know of expressive speech. Um, including the recent one, uh, it's all these are very unique uh, resources. So people across the world can use that for, you know, applying the latest and greatest, you know, advances in machine learning to actually scientifically look at jointly uh, some of these uh, uh, aspects. Right. Um, so I can show you how 
some of these new analytical modeling methods are can be used, right? I'll just illustrate a couple of things. For example, this was easy for us. Jane may earn more money by working hard. So you see these color coding things, right? Actually, they are um, um, automatically segmenting and tracking, right? It's a, it's a standard computer vision problem, right? But now we are looking at videos that are coming from MR. Um, and it's harder because these are not that, even though it looks great for MRI, it's still a very difficult domain to process. And so automatically processing early on, we did more mathematically uh, oriented ways of segmenting and tracking, you know, with anatomical constraints and all and so on. Um, but these are the things, if you think about from a controls point of view, right? We are, uh, uh, it's, when we produce speech or any action, right? Usually it's a, it's a task, right? Like, you know, activity recognition people have done. So you try to create a, a, a particular reach a goal, like usually it's a constriction goal and release. And when you're trying to make sounds, basically it's a series of these, uh, 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 achieving goals and facing them together. So knowing the movement of these articulators and how they've uh, 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 faced in space and time is the core aspect for modeling. So it's a nice you know, AI problem for us. Now, so of course, you know, uh, uh, with this kind of data, you can apply, imagine new ways of uh, the latest machine learning advances, you know, whether it is, you know, this is already old. Uh, you know, three years old is like too old and uh, machine learning. We looked at like, you know, longer context for tracking these vocal sort of uh, articulators with, you know, series of, you know, convol convolutional nets, uh, LSTMs and so on to do this uh, tracking. And it provides, I said, like, you know, from uh, data to analysis, right? Uh, we can use AI to support it. And, uh, so to make it more explicit, you no know, linguists like you know, uh, 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 so myself and our colleagues, uh, we are all like uh, students of articulatory phonology, meaning we believe in a dynamical systems way of looking at human speech production that we, you know, a series of constrictions are formed and released. And so we can actually start measuring these things now um, from data, right? It's, it's, it's super exciting. A long and, beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him a pronounced feeling of the utmost respect. Right? So this offers new ways of modeling, right? Uh, um, um, human, one of the core human facility. Again, it's, it's biological data. You know, so far I haven't talked about any health stuff yet, right? That we can sort of, we are able to sort of, you know, access information analyze information supported by these advances in computing, right? I, that's circle I talked about. Now this can be uh, sort of used to understand specific clinical questions also, right? Besides the uh, understanding how humans produce speech and language, right? So, I can no. So I'll, I'll play this again. So this is the patient with uh, uh, primary progressive aphasia, so basically a brain lesion, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, and that causes apraxia of speech, that is the ability to plan speech production movements, right? It's a very core thing. So I said that the production of speech involves many things, right? Like from sort of what we think about thought, right? That we have uh, to, it's uh, 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 planning in the, in the neural, and uh, the brain and signaling the appropriate movements, you know, motor and implementing that. Uh, so when you observe this patient now, right, you'll see uh, it's trying and planning and, you know, and there's no audio involved. If you're not able to uh, see the actual production, the clinicians only can make infer based on their auditory impressions, right? In fact, you can see that there are unphonated articulation of the same word. So, they, they can get a clearer picture of connecting the brain to behavior uh, if you actually demystify it with data, right? That's what we try to do. We, we are very data evidence driven. So let me play this again. You'll see. Oh. I can no. So, so you saw, you know, these, these faces and we can actually um, uh, really Used this in a very clinical way. So this patient, you know, so we work together with a colleague at uh, UCSF, uh, who's a neurologist, uh, 
and track this patient and we were able to get insights about this, this clinical status in ways that was not possible before. So the etiology Man. could be different, could be more disease oriented. So for example, uh, cancer, right? It affects uh, any of the tissues. It impairs you know, speech and swallowing, uh, maybe due to sort of the, uh, the disease itself, uh, muscle fat loss, uh, acacia uh, damage, or the treatment can in fact make it worse in some ways. You know, you, the primary goal is to keep the patient alive, right? Make, but then it also has a lot of side effects, right? Uh, you know, um, radiation reduces fibrosis, you know, the tissue structures changes, Surgical treatment really is radical. It removes parts of the, um, uh, that's affected. For example, in this patient, you see uh, in the image, um, this is it, this patient had uh, oral cancer in the front of the tongue. Uh, so that was removed, and you know, and the flap was replaced, uh, uh, used to replace that part. And so we wanted to know how sort of, you know, this would impact their functioning for speech and swallowing, for example. Um, so let me play this. This, this, that, that. So you see, right, like, you know, while the, this back portion is trying to function, the front portion is just moving along. It's not, if you remember the videos I showed from, uh, the patients didn't have cancer. So really we can get insights about how do you regain function like, you know, like speech, swallowing, so on post uh, surgery, right? Um, so it's not easy. Um, so we can first use again, all our mathematical and you know, uh, machine learning ideas to characterize these you know, uh, impact of the disease, right? And its treatment, right? For example, how flexible, like, you know, uh, can we index the flexibility post cancer? Uh, and we showed, like, you know, the degrees of freedom that's impacted, for example, because of the uh, surgical treatment. And uh, and so the generative model that they, the humans have to produce speech is compromised. And how? And so the therapist has to work with uh, the the rehabilitation has to work with this new uh, reality, right? Um, and so can we do better, right? Like, so here are some examples of things that are underway. So we wanted to see whether we can make this closed loop here, like you were saying for therapy for singers, right? Here we can provide, if the, you know, um, the whole journey of the patient. So, you know, say a patient is diagnosed with cancer, uh, can start with these evidence-driven ways of planning you know, uh, the treatment, so that has a minimal impact on post rehab. Once you have that then, because uh, sometimes you have to do what you have to do, uh, we can actually have a closed loop way of um, uh, gaining back some of the function that's, you know, lost because of the disease uh, and its treatment. So right now, you know, when you are, you can think about the patient, you image, the clinician provides sort of, you know, uh, ways of, gaining functions like for example this patient has lost a bunch of their uh, uh, tongue uh, because of cancer by surgery so the clinician then provides sort of you know uh, uh, what strategies to use to gain back specific uh, you know uh, abilities to um, say make sounds do swallowing because remember swallowing is one of the most important things you know, and if you swallow uh, wrongly, you know, there's aspiration and, you know, so those are core things that we don't even think about, uh, right? But uh, extremely important for not just quality of life, but healthy uh, life. Um, and so now we can actually have targets like, you know, provide. Uh, 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 so what we'll do is... Uh, 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 what they're doing is like you provide targets where, when they can see and they can try to practice uh, uh, making specific sounds, okay, to make a sound like D or to move the front of your tongue toward the, uh, that ridge and, and so on. So this kind of, you know, using a biofeedback tool uh, is possible, something that we are just working on with this interactive. So we won't have a scanner all the time. 
So one of the things that, you know, multimodally we can do is if you have these anchor points, a uh, couple of times you kind of know how things are progressing. And then perhaps just with uh, inverse modeling, uh, just from the audio, you can figure out with, uh, uh, say, a generative sort of you know, uh, um, uh, visualization of this, how we can predict this uh, uh, internal structure would be. Uh, we can have interactive computer-based feedback or with uh, maybe an easier imaging modality like ultrasound, right? Uh, so a lot of things are possible made you know, uh, with these uh, uh, AI uh, tools and, and appropriate data, right? That's why I wanted to emphasize this whole uh, cycle is important. So the other domains that we are working on is you know, understanding stuttering, uh, which is a uh, uh, condition, it's not a disease or anything, but you know, it, it does have uh, neurological underpinnings of you know, the ability to uh, plan and produce speech. A lot of open questions about you know, where is it like you know, affected is it in the planning or is it in the production? Uh, uh, so uh, some of our data, for example, and uh, let me play this. So there's initial consonant, you know. Uh, 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 so, but what we saw that um, while the person is trying to make that initial consonant, the, uh, the, uh, the posture for the following consonant is already uh, there, meaning it tells you it's not a planning. Uh, so when we are producing speech, right, we actually have a plan. Yeah, AI people know this. You know, we have to plan before we execute. And so, so it's not in the planning that happens. So it's more in the execution. So then we can figure out now if we are having therapeutic and other ways of uh, intervening uh, appropriately. So this is, again, work in progress uh, by Yijing, uh, one of our PhD students. Uh, we're also trying to study, you know, it's just a new NSF grant to study uh, the connection between planning production and the variability uh, in speech with these kinds of uh, methodologies. And one of the things I want to close back is this connection between sort of the brain body behavior mechanisms that are now possible because of these advances we are making this AI ecosystem, right? A project I'll give a shout out, like, you know, it's a, a, or an ISI project, we call it a precog under the DARPA NEAT program. Uh, it's trying to map the preconscious, uh, you know, uh, processing of uh, the brain response to uh, linguistics affective stimuli. We're using brain signals, uh, physiological signals, and behavioral signals to sort of try to understand are there differences between this processing if people are affected by sort of uh, mental health conditions like suicidal ideation or depression. So this is ongoing project. You know, we are uh, hopefully you'll hear more from colleagues uh, here at ISA and elsewhere later. So let me pause here before I switch to the next uh, topic. Any questions? Okay. So I will sort of pivot to another domain. Um, here we are, you know, again, inspired by sort of uh, needs in mental and behavioral health. Uh, as I uh, referred to, speech and language provide a, a sort of a window into the mind, if you may, uh, and, and changes in it. And so, uh, as you know, AI advances have, you know, been you know, tremendous in the last uh, several years, particularly across various aspects of speech and language processing, right? It's not just chat GPT or LLMs, right? There's so many different components to this human language technologies. And they offer us a lot of uh, ways of understanding many important health questions. For example, in autism, um, one of the, you know, we're always interested in does a particular treatment uh, result in the targeted behavior change? Measuring behavior change is a big thing. You know, many of you here know. Uh, and so um, we mm. use sort of, you know, uh, movement, you know, the, the timing is like, you know, provides a lot of insights into uh, in behavior, a uh, lot of insights into the quality of uh, something, right? So latency, you know, in interaction, you know, uh, you know is, is, is a uh, important um, uh, marker, biomarker, right? Because uh, if you wait too long, you know, you know, right, uh, uh, things break down. So we used, you know, what is typically used, you know, in, you know, uh, in processing uh, speech streams and other applications we have in it. 
to, to do this as a, and, and showed that it is a very powerful biomarker, right? So again, one example of AI being applied in studying response to treatment, I'll dig deeper. Uh, we can also use sort of, you know, this uh, uh, NLP and, you know, speech processing to look at changes over time. For example, in mental health, like such as uh, major depressive disorder, uh, we can collect uh, speech and language samples from people uh, easily. They can just, you know, uh, call or uh, answer a question or, uh, and the nature of variation gives us a lot of insights. In fact, we showed that uh, by looking at vocal and language features uh, over time, over a year, I made, you know, with in, in patients, not just two minute phone call every week, uh, answering questions, how, how you doing? That's it, it's an open-ended prompt. Actually uh, exercise your neurocognitive system and the signal, the quality of the signal tells you a lot. Uh, and, and we can show that uh, it was a useful marker or um, we, can, we can study psychotherapy, right? With just two people talking, uh, one trying to help the other. Um, and, but we know it has been elusive uh, what works for whom, when and how, uh, the dosage, how much uh, uh, the, the connection between the therapist and, the, and their client um, is it's not very well understood. Uh, it's a huge need, but not uh, so we in our lab, you know, with the collaborators uh, uh, for the last, you know, over the last 15 years, uh, with a lot of NIH projects and so on, we've been looking at understanding psychotherapy, uh, using all these tools of uh, AI. Uh, for example, we, we would be empathy expressed by the, the, the therapist and perceived by the client is a good marker of the therapy outcome, right? Mm -hmm. We were able to actually quantify that and as a quality assurance uh, uh, metric in psychotherapy. In fact, there's a startup that was launched uh, five, six years ago um, with USC as one of the partners, I was one of the co-founders of that. So a lot of things are possible with AI tools in, the, in, the, in this in this well, right? And so how do we think about this as an AI problem, right? We can think about, in many of these cases, right, uh, the clinician or the clinical researcher knows what construct they're after. For example, they want to characterize some construct like stress, you know. And we can think about how it is, uh, uh, it's, measured by these experts, either by reports, questionnaires that they give or clinical observation. What we can do is we can try to emulate that and make it a computational proxy for this, right? So for example, if it's based on clinical observation, say uh, in an interaction, what do you have? We have access to visual information, auditory information, linguistic information. We can say, well, okay, let's try to do that. So. One of the early things we started off was looking at couple therapy. People having relationship issues, they go to a therapist and they talk, and the therap uh, and the clinic there they are looking for characterizing things like you know affective dynamics, humor, blame patterns, and other what they and capture as behavioral codes, right? So they will. Um, so our early uh, venture into this was to say, well, can we automate these behavioral coding? Right from uh, audio, from language, from and, and so on, and you know we said you know so for example, can we predict uh, the perceived acceptance you know expressed by uh, the <clears throat> partners in interaction, you know, positivity, negativity, all the kinds of things that you know we work on in you know in sentiment analysis and etc. This is like twenty years ago, right? And so we what was interesting is we could get. Uh, um, um, algorithmic performance that was uh, uh, matching inter-annotator, inter-expert agreement. So it's a good start. And then once you start putting information just from audio itself, now you put language information, uh, visual information, you fuse, uh, it, it, it gets better and better, right? So in fact, it's also interpretable or explainable. People have said that, you know, the use of second person uh, pronouns is very, you know, uh, sort of in, in blame situations is, is, is implicated, right? The use of second person pronouns. And these models, you know, spit that out, information out like naturally. So it's a very interesting tool uh, instead of uh, human uh, annotators watching, you know, 45 minutes of a video, it's just like runs through it and emulates and spits out these things uh, based on what 
uh, they are experts we're looking for, but we can do more, right? Uh, as an example, I'll just point out to, we can also do things that are not uh, difficult or not possible for humans, like looking at, for example, uh, synchrony or entrainment patterns. So biological systems, when they are uh, want to show affinity or affiliation, they tend to synchronize at every level, uh, you know, uh, behavioral levels, uh, uh, you know, physiological level, and so on. And this is a conceptual framework, very abstract. We can find computational sort of you know models of these. Right? For example, we know prosodic entrainment. People start start to sound alike when they are aligned positively, right? So in a relationship which is showing distress or conflict, you expect that to be diverging, right? So that was the idea. So we um, did representations of say vocal prosody, right, and found similarity measures and showed that. By using these measures, we can predict the affective state, right, positive and negative. That was encouraging. Early on, we did this, these embeddings and so on, more traditional ways, right, like PCA, ICA type things. Later on, you know, fast forward, you know, move on to like more neural embeddings, uh, distances in the neural embeddings. But the idea is the same. And we can predict things like, you know, couple therapy outcome or sort of emotional bond and suicide risk assessment, all these things. Again, use of computational AI analyses to uh, get insights that was not possible before. Right? So, uh, I'll skip that. Of course, you know this. we don't need to stop uh, just for writing papers. We can actually create technology pipelines and launch. In fact, that's what I mentioned was then in the psychotherapy case. Uh, so we have automated therapy ev evaluation. Uh, we can put this whole pipeline together. And this was, uh, so, launched a startup, but this also sort of, you know, promotes newer ideas and um, uh, methods for uh, advancing the core AI stuff. For example, you know, some of the things in our PhD students in our my lab have done, how, how can we con combine speech and text together, you know, uh, to do better behavioral assessments? Uh, can we do end-to-end? -end? We don't need to go through any text representation. Can we go from the recordings to behavioral code assessments um, with these various transformers and so on, right? It's all exciting, you know, uh, uh, but the idea is concepts. Are, can we now look across various the psychotherapy me uh, methods, right? Not um, motivational interviewing, DBT, CBT, what are common across this? Can we learn from, you know, if you truly think about large models that capture uh, a general therapeutic mechanisms and then, you know, adapt to specific therapeutic uh, uh, mechanisms. What can we do? How can we capture context? So all these interesting questions now uh, emerge and we can build tools that can be, you know, clinically useful. We can generalize. So those are the things AI can help, right? And as I said, that this was like, you know, disseminate is being disseminated, used in the clinics. So it's not just ideas. Can we go beyond these traditional clinical settings to home workplace? Because, you know, um, mental health needs are not just in, you know, uh, specific disorders or disease conditions, but, you know, happen day to day, we regulate uh, our, you know, status, stress, for example, right? Uh, so, um, one of the things, you know, a couple of our former sort of students or professors now, um, uh, they did was to see, can we predict uh, uh, a conflict before it happens in the couple's context, right? So they were using multimodal information, uh, you know, behavioral information, physiological information, their own self-reports to see if they can predict an upcoming conflict and then they can intervene before a fight happens. <laughs> And you know, in fact, they have patents and so on in this and the startup. Uh, so this again was uh, was made possible by advances in AI. The whole thing, measuring, modeling, uh, synthesizing, and intervening right, is a great example. And this is uh, Professor Gail Morgan from Psychology, uh, who's a very expert. You know, was, was the collaborator here. I mentioned this. Uh, tracking this mental illness to uh, analysis of speech. So I'll skip this since it's possible. The other project, you know, which we did it, uh, from ISI was the TILES project. Now we wanted to study day-to-day uh, -day stress regulation, you know, in relation to burnout and uh, and stress in workplace. So we were we chose the healthcare system as the workplace, and we studied 
healthcare providers. This was before the pandemic uh, when we started the project, and we didn't know that we were sort of you know a little bit ahead of time there. <laughs> uh, it was not planned, and so this actually enabled us to think about this again, this AI ecosystem. How can we measure things that uh, about day-to-day uh, -day behaviors, biobehavioral processes of people in workplace, how they are balancing their demands that are cognitive, social, emotional, uh, and physical, right? Imagine nurses, uh, 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 medical residents, and so on. They're running around, solving problems, dealing with families, tough questions, you know. How are they day-to-day -day balancing this? Can we measure this, understand it, predict when there are, the, there are differences that need intervention because you have to be well to be taking care of others' well-being. So this was a very interesting project we studied. We wired up uh, our hospitals, uh, Keck Hospital, North Cancer, and so on. I uh, got data from almost like 400 people over three months of time. We've released these data sets uh, for things. So for example, we showed that uh, uh, difference between day shift and night shift people, right? So night shift people, um, you know, and they wake up and go to sleep at different time and, uh, compared to day shift people. But even when they're not working, right, we see that the, the sleep patterns of the night shift people are completely, so sleep is one of the big uh, important things for our well-being, right? In fact, we showed that if you look at the circadian rhythm of night shift uh, versus day shift people, you can have a regular pattern for people who regular day work versus night shift people. So these kinds of things can be quantified and in fact can be used uh, in predictive aspects of atypical events happening using these physiological signals of key. In fact, did some uh, very interesting modeling work in showing that how sort of, you know, context, fast context of events plus physiological signal can help predict upcoming events, right? So a lot of these things are possible with a combination of data analysis, inference, and modeling, right? Again, that's a refrain I'm using. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, uh, the last example I want to give was uh, from the domain of autism, right? I mentioned that, you know, uh, I, I talked about it. It's a very highly prevalent condition. Um, you know, it's uh, neurogenetic in origin, but uh, uh, characterized by differences in social communication, reciprocity, et cetera. What can you know, AI and all these things do? Um, one thing is machine learning. Now we show the current, you know, what the status quo is, right? They use different instruments to uh, diagnose and characterize. We can make that better by using our you know, machine learning ideas like reinforcement learning and, you know, optimization to do that in a more efficient and scalable way, right? Straightforward. We can also get insights into processes that are, you know, uh, um, clinical processes. For example, uh, ADOS is the gold standard uh, to, for diagnostics, you know, autism diagnostic observation schedule, right? So, for example, it's very qualitative. There, the, the person that is the sensor and uh, uh, learner is the clinician, right? Can we complement that with automated analysis, right? Like we know from you know, speech language processing, computer vision, and so on, standard AI uh, applications. Um, to cut the story short, since we're running out of time, uh, we showed that uh, not only can we use these uh, um, features from the uh, child to predict severity and characterize, we can also use the information from the interacting person who is responding to the, uh, the child with the condition to predict the uh, severity of the clinical condition. Did you get that? So mm -hmm. when two people are interacting, right, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a linked process. So you have very useful clinical signal, not only from the patient, but from the clinician as well. So we showed that by just monitoring the clinician, we can predict the uh, patient's condition. Right. Wow. Yeah. So these are possible by, you know, by using these kinds of methodological sort of uh, tools. And we can operationalize this, uh, quantifying the synchrony between sort of uh, the interacting participants. And we can show that, in fact, you know, with water fancy <laughs> uh, machine learning tool you want to apply. But these ideas, right, what I want to emphasize here is that, you know, tools and methodologies will follow if we can formulate the right questions 
together with our clinical colleagues um, and, and, and together, right, now we, we can do better. So that's an idea. So, and in the process, we can, you know, advance uh, computing and, uh, uh, and the methodologies that we develop as well that can be broadly applicable. We did with speech, with uh, interaction, with facial expressions. We showed that the, what's true for the vocal expressions, the same, uh, a smile might be there in a person with autism, but it's always uh, clinically sort of, you know, characterized by being awkward or atypical. What does it mean, right? Now, can we, what creates that perception? We can actually show that the complexity of this, um, uh, the, the reasons that are involved in creating these expressions is uh, lower. We can quantify that. And then this can be clinically meaningful. In fact, we showed that uh, um, how this is also not a very uh, 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 as a trait. It's actually uh, uh, modulated by the social context. So for example, when you're interacting, right, but your vocal, visual, all these elements are coordinated in space and time to create expressions, right? If that coordination is uh, uh, difficult and of timing and coordination because of the, the, the health condition variation, right? Then you have to provide the uh, appropriate sort of you know, uh, space to have interaction. Now, in social context, we found that it's further uh, exacerbated. So if we understand these things, right, then we can appropriately educate people or, you know, and, and so on to see where the challenges are and how we can support uh, people's experiences. So AI can be so useful both for discovery, but also for tools. So some of the things underway, you know, we are doing things, you know, assessing language levels in ASD. Uh, what do we do in, you know, in early development? We can apply for later similar conditions, but different presentations or different conditions, but uh, similar presentations in dementia and Alzheimer's, which we are studying. Um, but I want to conclude this talk with highlighting two colleagues, you know, both of whom I uh, uh, honored to work with in their sort of as their mentors. Uh, one is an OCD, Dr. Adam Frank uh, at Keck. You know, just to give an example of the kinds of uh, collaborations one could build across USC. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank is interested in, you know, OCD. Uh, uh, so it's actually a condition that is uh, very comorbid with things like suicidal, suicidal ideation. Uh, it's very prevalent. Uh, and But the treatment, like many uh, mental health conditions, is by trial and error. And we have no idea with what's a good combination yet, right? But, uh, true personalized evidence driven treatments are still uh, to be discovered. And maybe uh, com computational experts can contribute here. Um, so we are launching a tiles like study with like you know sensors, uh, neuroimaging, and you know interventions and EMAs to try to map you know what is behind this for, uh, for each patient and can we actually use data, the digital health of the future kind of an idea to help with the overall treatment in a more personalized way. So that's the idea of. Uh, the other is in the neuro-ophthalmology, uh, Dr. Melinda Chang, another uh, collaborator. Um, uh, so we, you know, I'll show you one example of the thing that we are working on together, a few things we're working on. Uh, this is this condition uh, called papilledema, in, uh, which is especially difficult in children um, because the presentations are very hard to uh, discern from typically what's done with the fundus images, images, uh, photographs of the retina, right? If this happens as edema, the swelling happens, uh, you know, in, in the optic nerves, either due to this uh, uh, neurological sort of condition, or just, it can also be a false alarm, you know, elevated sort of without swelling, it's not dangerous. So the correct uh, diagnosis is important. And so, uh, so this is a classic, you know, uh, AI problem, you know, so you, you know, analysis part, once you have the right data and so on, we showed that, you know, by using information, clinical information assessment by multiple experts, we can actually do uh, well, you know, in an explainable way with this AI algorithms with sort of, you know, networks and better signal processing and so on. So again, an ex good, uh, you know, defining the problem together Data, good data processing, and then bringing AI tools. 
So, you know, in fact, um, ophthalmology is an area where AI has had early wins, right? When, uh, <laughs> diagnostic aspects of known retina, diabetic retinopathy and so on. So we can show that in this paper just got published in ophthalmologic science and in you know, image processing conference, they can do that. So in conclusion, what I want to say, you know, when we're trying to you know, marry these ideas from computing and AI with issues in health, um, not only do we need to sort of you know, create trustworthy uh, processing and uh, trusted technology, we also have to understand, you know, what is applicable in some cases may not be needed or maybe uh, unnecessary in other cases. So the answer is it's not a very clear picture, right? It depends on the case. And so as you know, computer scientists, we have to be very mindful of these kinds of things, both in creating technologies that allow for this, but also the, the broader socio-technical aspects of these. It's a separate talk in itself, but I, I wanted to, conclude with that slide, at least in, in mind, because while we want to make sure the tools are inclusive for all patients, regardless of who they are, uh, you know, it has to be respecting privacy, not just for legal purposes, but also from social, uh, cultural purposes. It has to be safe. It can be, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable to attacks and other kinds of things, you know, some of the algorithms we develop. So this kind of while we are trying to understand addressability, Right, which was where we started. I think there's a lot of other things that are in the background that we need to worry about. Um, so, um, in summary, you know, there's lots of you know uh, promise that these uh, technologies hold in supporting decision making, action, response. You know, whether it is making things we know how to do, clinicians know how to do, but maybe provide scale, efficiency, you know, cost effectiveness or create new tools for discovery that can be you know, useful for diagnostics and intervention. So that's the exciting part. So I think this can truly profoundly transform how we sort of you know, do science in, in biomedical, like in health fields, but also provide care for people. I, I truly believe in that. So I hope you know, uh, uh, this will continue to go on. So thank you for listening to me. I think he has a question for you. Sure. Adam, go for it. Hey, thanks. Can you hear me, Sree? I can hear you well. How are you? <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, awesome stuff, as always. Um, I just want to ask a quick question, and it's not a fair one, which I'm sort of famous for. So I noted in my chat, Dennis Hassabis, I spelled it correctly, even though chat changed it to uh, Dennis Hassan. Thank you. I don't correct. Dennis Hassabis gave an uh, interview recently in which he was I think bravely predicting that uh, through DeepMind and their spinoff, there will be like an uptick in AI designed drugs going into clinical trial in the next three to five years. Uh, that's first of all, bold is a prediction, which is great. But secondly, I noticed what you didn't say was more people will be dying less often because of these drugs. Because he's aware that there's this enormous like clinical trial series of bottle messages. So I want to ask you an unfair question and say, of all the amazing things that you are working on and put forth today, where do you predict we'll see the biggest impact of health outcomes? What domain, mental health, would it be a physiological disease, et cetera? Uh, what specific outcome? Reduced suicide, reduced divorces, uh, you know, reduced reduce deaths from a particular disease. And when, when do you think we'll see that? Uh, and then some other time you can tell me about all the bottlenecks that are again between your prediction and reality. Over. Well, thank you. That's a loaded question. <laughs> so personally, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a vice customer, right? So uh, what I would like to see a really big impact is not disassociating the psychological, the psychiatric aspect of one's health and well-being from the physical and other aspects. You know? So you look at any condition across the lifespan, you know, these are all very intertwined. And so being able to step back and look and you know, address these questions from a more holistic perspective, I feel it can be enabled and made possible and, and, and translated with you know, advances in this eco, you know, machine computing uh, 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 intelligence ecosystem, right? In terms of you know, where we see you know, in the next one to three years, even three to five years, I feel healthcare access and delivery globally. I feel that you know, um, the ability to do you know, uh, uh, Diagnostics and you know and, and you know um, across many of these conditions that are global, 
um, can be accelerated with this, this, you know, it's not just, you know, that's in Los Angeles or the, you know, California or the US, but globally, if we can think about, you now, can we scale up how we uh, can screen, diagnose and treat or provide access? Can we deliver push care to people, uh, you know, in ways that we haven't thought about, like, you know, can we use our cell phones, right? I've penetrated many of the societies. Uh, I feel there, we, we can have a huge impact. So these big, you know, scale things, you know, running even a clinical trial with not just thousand people, 2000 people, how about a million people, uh, truly inclusive ways, not understanding, for example, Type two diabetes, you know, across the world, you know, are are you know uh, nutritional issues. For example, in million people, like truly have inclusive ways of understanding and uh, and think about how we can scale up. I, I feel those are the exciting possibilities, you know, if if, if we were to dream. Uh, but it's doable with today's even with today's technology. I feel. <clears throat> So I've got a related question. It, it involves uh, getting people to trust the technology that you produce, and, and you know, in particular, doctors, patients, etc. Can can you talk? I mean, because you're doing some things that are very pushing the state of the art in computing and applying them to problems. But uh, how do you get conservative medical institutions, insurers, etc., to, to adopt these? That's a very good question, Mike. I, I think you know, the question is, you know, how do we build a trust with the people involved? So, so when I, if you remember, my when I put forth in my first slide, right, I said like, you no, know, there's convergence that's happening in technologies, right? That'll happen, you know, innovation and so on. The second part is the people, right? My own experience is like, you know, if from the get go we are all together on the same thing in helping formulate and answer the question, so we have a common grounding in. What is important clinically? It's a dialogue, right? It's not easy working together uh, from the get-go, right? Uh, that's one thing. The second is like same kind of dialogue with the people that, that are impacted, you know, whether it is you know families, patients, and so on, in a very participatory way. And you know, if the people see impact, right, they'll use it, right? Uh, you know, you know, in in a way. How do you build trust is by, you know, all the people who are involved, stakeholders should be equal participants, right? Like right from the beginning. So when we are sort of, for example, like, you know, putting our own uh, view of AI and uh, computing for health uh, idea, uh, working with our colleagues, uh, uh, the potential people that will be impacted uh, as much as possible in helping define the questions the solutions, the adoption of the solutions, and so on is important. You know, the Tiles project, right? I still remember. Um, it seemed like sort of a very uh, truly wacky thing to do, right? Say, oh, we are going to go into a major working hospital or tertiary care, and we're going to wire up people, wire up their environment, <laughs> and when you know, uh, how are we going to do this, right? So, the, we actually went and talked to the, the people like who are going to be our uh, volunteers, like nurses and doctors, the system, the people who are managing, providing value through care, ask them, hey, what would you like to learn from if this were the case? What are the sort of possibilities? What are the challenges? What would you suggest, you know, sense of would you wear? You know, uh, will you wear a bio shirt? <laughs> You know, they're coming to the ship. The for, for last thing in you know, their mind is to put on the sensors and, you know, but they did it because, you know, they were, had ownership in the process right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we, how can we scale this sort of small mm -hmm. experiences in, in bigger ways as we are imagining together? And so I think the social technical aspect, you know, that's why, you know, we have people like, you know, not only AI experts, experts in anthropology and so on, right? In our midst. <laughs> Adam, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. How we work with people, and I think that should be uh, a core part of the design. Uh, at least in my very little narrow view, I found that to be the most impactful. Um, I still remember in the autism domain, uh, before machine learning and all and things were sort of popular 15 years ago, we said, well, we're going to apply all this to do this. And they were skeptical. But with the right experts and you show 
uh, small impacts, small wins and gains together. Now, you know, if you go to autism meeting, everyone is talking about you know, deep learning in the keynote. <laughs> so it's a big change. Uh, <clears throat> I think it will happen, but it's a, it's a journey. Um, I, it's kind of related to that. So how do you think about the generalizability or lack of generalizability or gener or strength of generalizability of the um, findings that you're getting in these specific, um, in these small sample studies? Um, and I'm, it's, of course, it's going to differ by um, the, the application, but I guess for the, for, for example, like the tile study. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is about, you know, the generalizability of these approaches and, and, uh, 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 and models and tools, right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a, the answer is like more uh, nuanced and complex, you know, uh -huh. <clears throat> things that are, I feel are generalizable are the approaches or how we frame these things, right? Like, you know, that how we set up measurements, what do we measure, uh, how we model them. The actual models and so on may depend on uh, what we found was very individual specific in their context. So, but that is one of the strengths of the scalable adaptability of these uh, approaches are one of the big strengths of, you know, this computing things that we are bringing to the table, right? We don't need to work on means and averages but we can actually individualize and, and mm -hmm. things allow things to uh, be adaptive and you know and so on. Um, so, and but also it begs for to uh, shines light on you know where we are missing right and what are the factors that are creating this challenges to generalizability. When I talked about this, um, uh, the multiple factors of uh, uh, variability. We may be interested in one factor of variability that's related to the health condition that we are trying to target. But uh, confounding are, or maybe are things that are others, context, you know, demographics, other things that we may, may or may not have measured. And so computational methods can actually let us quantify these things instead of just sweeping it and saying, well, it's, it's, it's a spectrum thing or heterogeneity. And so I think these are important questions, but I would say if we were to generalize, right, it's generalizing and scaling up is more um, uh, appealing um, than the same method or model applicable about everyone, right? It, I, I think adaptivity, uh, scaling, and cost, I, I, I feel, are even more um, sort of uh, impactful, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have one perhaps one last question. Sure. Um, uh, now this, first of all, thank you for this really insightful uh, seminar. So my question is on the integration of uh, integration of uh, uh, speech uh, analysis, emotion recognition, and these uh, MRI technologies towards development. How can these contribute to developing a personalized treatment plans, considering that cancer and anatomy is really variable and uh, there's a lot of variation in the uh, in the cognitive behavior of patients, and also more importantly, how far are we from seeing this practically be implemented into clinical workflows? Yeah, very good question. So the question was, how can advances in speech and affective computing, etc., alongside sort of a novel measurement of imaging, be brought into clinical workflows? Yeah, so again, like that's uh, very similar to what like the previous question, right? Working with the uh, uh, the clinician, like the surgeon, or who, uh, um, and on the one hand, and the, the speech language uh, therapist and the linguists uh, together, right? All of this, you know, it takes a, a truly a village, uh, basically uh, different minds coming together and converging uh, in imagining, you know. Are we able to observe and measure things uh, that we want to see? And that's what inspired us, you know, what kind of methodologies we can figure out to observe. How do you then make sense out of this data that we are gathering? Uh, can it uh, um, not only improve our clinical knowledge about that particular patient and their condition, as you pointed out, right? every patient is different, where their cancer is, how they're gonna be treated, the treatment plan, um, 
and and what kind of uh, rehab uh, will follow. It's all individualized. So these things can be individualized. So in fact, the current study, we have like about like a dozen patients that we have seen through the journey. So cancer, I always view as a journey, right? It's uh, uh, from the point, you know, if you suspect and diagnose to the various treatment, right? It's not just, you know, the schemo, depending on the particular condition. A lot of things that are happening, not only in the body, but also in their mind, not only of the patient, but also their network. So when we think about, you know, stepping back, uh, these AI supported solutions, right? We can support not only the patient, but all the people that are caring for them. And that opens up new possibilities of thinking about, you know, healthcare, right? Uh, if you, you know, um, um, and so, and it can be personalized. You know, it doesn't need to be just uh, uh, a particular important event like a surgery to remove a particular uh, uh, sort of diseased uh, organ, right? It's what hap happens after that, right? Uh, and how are they doing? You know, can they regain what they want to regain? You know, uh, quality of life. So we can think about care as a journey. And this is where I feel, again, you know, uh, computer scientists and, you know, uh, technologists and all these ideas we can imagine can contribute to the clinical uh, care, the clinicians, the therapists, because, you know, I think together, you know, it can be better. So at least that, that's, that's my sort of dream, but I'm probably uh, uh, sort of, you know, dreaming too much. Okay, at this point, I think we need to thank Sri, and um, he'll be around a little bit for one-on-one -on -one questions, and I hope for lunch as well. So uh, thank you again. It was a great talk. <laughs>